Would you say that most of our sufferings have stemmed from childhood complexities? I would say yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the Mo Show podcast. Uh, Madiha, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, your daughter, Sara, is a um, is a good friend of mine for over a decade since my days in Boston. And when she reached out to me saying, uh, Mo, I have a guest for you to put on your podcast. And I said, uh, sure, uh, who, who would it be? Expecting that you know she was going to mention some famous actor or actress. And then she was like, it's my mom. I'm like, whoa, I never got that one before. <laughs> I'm like, no further questions. Absolutely. It would be my honor. Um, and uh, and then I reached out to you and I saw your page and I saw what you do. And, uh, and it's beautiful. So uh, thank you for taking time and coming on the show. Totally my pleasure. Really, truly. Um, so Madiha Ajroush uh, is a psychotherapist uh, of 25 years, mashallah, tabarakallah, a graduate of Columbia University School of Counseling Psychology. She's a mother of two girls who all live in Riyadh here in Saudi Arabia. Madiha, can you give me a little bit of background on your practice and um, what kind of help you offer in your facility? Yeah. I'm a psychotherapist and my training is actually more analytical and psychodynamic. What that means is more talk, therapy, no medication. A lot of people sort of confuse psychotherapy with uh, psychiatry. Psychiatries are people who graduate from medical school and give medication. Uh, psychotherapy is more of a talk therapy and it's more curative uh, with talk. Now. I think maybe the question is, how does talk therapy actually helps mental health? And more and more we're getting to know that talk therapy is actually has a great influence in the structure of the brain. Uh, meaning that when we take MRIs before therapy and after therapy, we see that the structure of the brain actually changes with the blood flow coming in. So sometimes when I talk to my clients and they say, uh, well, I don't know how that changed. I, I never talked about it in therapy. And the reason is because talk therapy actually has this rippling effect impact on the individual. What that means is you talk about X, but then at the end you hear yourself, you know, you, you see improvement in many different parts of your life without even bringing it into the 45 minutes session. Um, how it works is um, it's a really good question, but I think it's getting in touch with feelings. And it's something people are not very comfortable with, even though more and more now people are talking about feelings and much more aware of it. But still, when there's pain, when it comes to feelings, they don't want to talk about it. They want to just sort of, uh, you know, let's put it aside because it's really painful. Childhood memories, um, uh, you know, sexual abuse, um, um, identity issues, uh, and, uh, you know, so a lot of it is very, very painful. Depression, uh, post-traumatic, and that's a big one. Um, so... They don't want to open the Pandora door because if they do, it really comes all out. So it's best not to talk about it, not to talk about feelings when it's painful. However, feelings do haunt the individual. If you don't talk about it and you don't explore it and you don't go to the depth of it, what happens is it's going to come back. It's going to come back in nightmares, dreams, behavior, anxiety, Phobia, even OCD, is going to come out somehow or another. So it has to be tackled. Would you say that most of our sufferings uh, have stemmed from childhood complexities? I would say yes. Yes. And whoever walks in the door for the first session, I would immediately go into the childhood. You know, give me a little background on the childhood. And immediately you could tell a lot by the composition of the family and what happened to them in childhood, yes. Parents are responsible for the future health of a child's mental health. 
Absolutely. They really are. They're number one because the child opens their eyes to see the mom and the dad, and they're the first people they interact. Actually, they learn how, at the attachment. They learn how to be attached in the first 18 months, which means that that will dictate how their future romantic relationship will be, marriage will be, how they treat their children in the first 18 months of the child. It's almost like an in, they, they inherit the treatment they get and it becomes part of their DNA complexion, if you will. If they've received love, they'll love, you know, they'll radiate love. If they received abandonment, um, you know, it'll be a complexity that they carry in their lives. Um, and I don't think we underscore that enough today uh, as, as parents, um, you know, everything we do, every action, can cause a reaction or will cause a reaction in the lives of our children and it's something to bear in mind you know as we uh, uh, as we go about our lives as parents because they're constantly watching us and they're taking notes mentally physically you know they are you're absolutely right i the the, the research says that children are intuitive to parents meaning that whatever the parent does they pick it up about 80 to 90% Parents, at their best, they're intuitive to children, 30%, meaning that they sort of know what the child is actually doing. So children know far more about their parents. However, having said that, parents are human beings, and they make mistakes. And the best thing about children is you could fix it, and you could fix it really fast. So, you know, I don't want parents to sort of uh, feel too anxious. Are they doing the right thing? You know, we're human beings and we do the best and our best is good enough. What does that mean? Is being available to the child at times of need. Yeah. And that is the best. That's that's what it's about. You know, children are forgiving. I see it in, in, in my four year old. Um, you know, they're quick to forget and they are born with positivity. Yeah. Um, you know, that's their blank canvas, if you will. I want to go back to uh, your days in uh, in Colombia uh, when you were there in in, in the school of uh, counseling psychology. Uh, you know that was in was it the mid nineties? So you're looking at about twenty five years ago when you graduated yes, from there. Yes, I did. So yeah. what triggered you to want to enter the field uh, of psychotherapy? That's a good question. Always, always in my life, I've always wanted to be. I didn't even know the name. I wanted to help people emotionally, and I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have, what is it called? And finally, I discovered there's something called counseling or something called therapy, you know, for emotions. And I got so excited when, when I found that out. Of course, I found that out at high school when I was in high school. So I went ahead and, and fought very hard that those days, uh, you know, fathers don't want to send their daughters to to the States. So I had to fight and fight. But then finally, um, Sara's father came and felt sorry for me, and he married me <laughs> <laughs> and took me to <laughs> Colombia. He's <laughs> a lucky guy, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so and I, I, I did my uh, graduate there, and I've also done my postgraduate, which really gave me a lot of training uh, in the in-depth uh, mental health of mm -hmm. human beings really very much in depth so it's not only counseling it's more analytical more psychodynamic more in depth and uh, it was the institute of psychodynamic it's in new york city mm -hmm. and uh, it gave me really a foundation of asking very difficult questions and knowing how to deal very difficult cases and that has been the foundation of my training actually the uh, the institute mm -hmm. So within your practice slash facility here in Saudi Arabia, what are some of the um, mental health issues that people would come to you to seek help on? I would say everything. You know, depression is number one. Anxiety is also. Anxiety, if it's left alone, it turns into a depression. Um, um, work issues. Mm -hmm. um, parent issues. Um just life issues. I even have some people who would say, you know, I really don't have a problem, but I want to know myself more. Can you do that? 
you know. And I like that. It's because they really want to be introspective and understand themselves better. And then the more we understand about our, on our emotions, the more we command our lives, actually. Where do we stand today in terms of people being okay coming in for treatment? It used to, it, I mean, it was, a, it was almost a taboo for the longest time, but today I feel like we are more accepting, are we not? You're absolutely right. Yes, we are much more accepting. The stigma is much less, even in Saudi Arabia, people are very open. And I think what's exciting is they understand the symptoms of depression, the symptoms of anxiety, they label it, they come and they say, I have this and I wanna sort of uh, work on it, which is great. Where when I first began 25 years ago, um, people would come severely depressed and they wouldn't even know that they are. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, they don't know the symptoms of depression. So it's a very exciting time. Um, to be working with the younger generation, it really is. Uh, they're very open and they're very comfortable with their own feelings and, and they don't care about the stigma. They just don't even see it. How young are we talking, some of these patients? Well, I do. I, I even do children. Uh, but right now with the COVID situation, and I've actually moved my um, practice into um, digital meaning it's all on uh, FaceTime or Google Do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I found it that it's very effective also, just as effective, if not even more. So... Because your reach is now global. I mean, they don't have to be in Saudi or... They're more, yes, they're more global. I'm, I even take students from the States, you know, Saudi students from the States, and because they're more comfortable with someone who's very familiar. Yeah with the culture and also very familiar with the Western culture. So there's, they tend to, you know, to be more comfortable with that. Isn't it crazy that it's a topic that isn't talked or discussed or taught in school? That bothers me. Yes, I think that the, a lot of the symptoms needs to be taught to identify it rather than just wonder. When you see a child sort of daydreaming, they say, oh, they're daydreaming child could be actually daydreaming and depressed yeah. at the same time or if you're OC you know OCD or or went through a trauma you know even though a trauma a car accident that you're close to death now if that's not treated you're gonna be facing a lot of problems later on later you know years you will have nightmares you will have all sorts of symptoms that you can't really connect mm -hmm. to the accident. So um, the earlier, the better also. So in your practice, Madiha, um, do you practice more on, on, on past, present, or future, or do you touch on, on all three elements? Definitely all three. The past is just as important as the present because if the individual is not dealing with the present, and, and whatever they're doing is getting in the way, then definitely there's something going on. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be ad addressed immediately. But then the reference is always in the past. That's why you got, you are where you are and struggling where you're struggling because of the past. Yeah. Whenever I read um, like articles or, or, or books uh, on the subject of mental health, there's a common theme that you always wanna be in the present. You know, you want to stay in the present. Looking at the past can be depressing. Looking to the future can cause anxieties because you're trying to imagine how will things pan out. So focus on the present. Uh, when I started to incorporate that in my life, um, I just felt more at peace, you know, and, and Absolutely, yeah. less, less anxious. Yeah. And I think people who struggle with anxiety, they tend to, most, most of the time, they tend to focus on the future. And what happens when you focus on the future, your whole life is based on the future, but the future hasn't happened yet. It's not there yet. So you're worried and f afraid of something that hasn't happened yet. So focusing on the here and now, meaning right now, right this second, what's happening? So it, it brings back the focus on here and now, it calms the individual down. Also, a person with anxiety may also struggle with these negative thinking, the negative automatic thinking, that, that kind of these negative thoughts that come in, and they're more about bringing, you know, j just, just totally negative talk. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of people would say, oh, well, 
no, don't worry. Alhamdulillah, things will be okay, you know. So that's the worst thing you could do to negative thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Is because when the negative thinking hits and you're saying everything will be okay, you're actually still talking about the negative thinking. You're still identifying that it exists. So what you do is you do not say even positive things. You bring it back to the here and now. Because even when you talk to the negative talk, negative thinking, positive uh, feedback, you're still confirming the negative thinking. Um, it's there. It's you're, there. It's being acknowledged. It's, it's, it's being acknowledged. Yeah. So don't acknowledge it at all. Yeah. Um, meditation and its effect on mental health. Is it as important as I'm hearing it to be? Is I mean, should people who suffer from anxieties or, or depression, is meditation something that they should incorporate into their lives? Meditation is great, calms the brain down, but it doesn't give you the skills. Okay. You know, it just says, oh, you know, bring in the thought and let them go out. And it doesn't, it doesn't give you the, doesn't give you the skills. It doesn't tell you how to get rid of your anxiety. You know, uh, keep your mind peace and quiet. That's great. And, it, and, and if you can, that's great. But then it doesn't give you the skills. Um, cognitive therapy is great. It gives you the skills, you know, and it tells you you've got to do one, two, three, and it gives you homework. It's great. But my issue with cognitive therapy, if it's not, if it's not taking even a few steps further, which is going back to childhood, you know, and the depth of the issue and why you've got anxiety to begin with, relapse happens mm -hmm. so you know it, anxiety will appear some way or some form even with cognitive therapy so you may get rid of some of the symptoms of anxiety because you have the skills but then at the end you don't know the core reason for that mm -hmm. the same goes for depression you gotta know the root cause of it why do you have it to begin with mm -hmm. I can completely attest to that because I, you know, if I'm feeling a little uh, on edge or, you know, mild symptoms of anxieties, I'd go for a good workout. Okay. And it, it's great for the next 24 hours. Um, uh, but then I didn't really get to the root problem because yeah. if I take a day or two off a workout the following, like if I, if I don't work out the next two or three days, these symptoms would linger back. Yeah. So I think getting to the root problem uh, is uh, is really everything, you know, just yes. like anything in life, addressing okay. it. Yeah, addressing it, yeah. How do you go about addressing it? Seeking help? Talking? Talk therapy that definitely does a lot of work, you know, and if you can get a hold of a therapist, then you could sort of talk to um, a friend, you know, and a friend that hopefully would just listen, yeah. you know, listen, you know, talking and listening to yourself, but not talking to yourself, because when you're talking to yourself, you probably not make so much sense and go to places and go out of the, the conversation mm -hmm. immediately. So talking with a friend, you've got to make sense when you talk to a friend. And then you hear yourself, and hopefully you choose a friend that's a real good listener. When you hear yourself, you could, you could have a lot of insight from yeah. that and get somewhere perspective perspective yeah. yeah and understand a couple of things that would take you maybe a long way mm -hmm. yeah talking communication really is uh, is key yeah you're absolutely right you know just getting it off your chest i think can do a lot more for you than than, than you think yeah absolutely um i know you can't for client confidentiality but without mentioning any names was there a story that you know you recall from your 25 years of practice um of like a, a nice recovery, someone who was in a dark place and because he did X based on what you told him or her, they have recovered to be Y. I have a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> totally get it if you, if you don't want to share. Uh, no, me meaning that I have a lot of stories because people when they do come, they do look for recovery and of course they will be recovered, mm -hmm. you know. Um, 
I mean, my friends would look at me and they would say, oh my God, you know, this is a heavy job and it's depressing. I don't even look at it that way. It isn't depressing at all. It's because when I work with my clients, I see how how much they've developed and worked hard and moved forward. And for me, that's a celebration. Yeah. So I don't see the heaviness of uh, people who sort of view a therapist as, oh, you know, all the problems you could hear. No, it's, a, it's the hard work that the individuals actually work so hard in moving forward. Yeah. So if anybody comes to therapy, they're very serious. Mm -hmm. They're very, very serious about moving forward. They already won. They've already won. Thank you. Yes, and 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 they are going to work really yeah. hard and sustain it. What is it? The first step towards recovery is admitting, but they've gone way beyond admitting. They're they're they've seeked help. Yeah. You know, they've 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 admitted, they've invested, and now they're seeking help. For, yeah. So they're they're like way over the hump and it's just admiring, you know, the amount of people who are okay with looking for help the amount of people that are offering help it's it's a new world that we yeah. live in here in saudi again i mean just not too long ago it was considered taboo to talk about yes. your mental health and now that's no longer it still longer takes issue. a lot of courage it to go to a therapist it sure. really does you know it's, it's it's not an easy step to mm -hmm. take and we have to respect that enormously marriage counseling is on is on the rise here like facilities that offer counseling for for, for marriages is on the rise then again so is the divorce rates yeah. So the the problem is acknowledged, uh, and that's probably why there have been more active therapists in the marriage counseling department, which is good to see. Yes, it's it's really is exciting, and I think that more and more uh, young people are coming back uh, from from the West, you know, and and being educated in the field, and um, and it's exciting to meet them all mm -hmm. and um, see them having practices and actually applying all the skills that they've learned. Yeah. What about addiction, Madiha? Is that something that you also treat? Is that something that is of prominence uh, in our region? It's very prominent, yes, it's very, very prominent. And families and actually struggle a whole lot on it. Addiction, you know, you would think that, okay, if we take the person to a therapist, they're going to fix the addiction. Absolutely not. Um, the addict has to say, I have a problem. The addict has to go to a place where they help addicts. And there is a whole entire support system. One therapist cannot do it. I mean, it just cannot be done with one therapist. And we don't have a lot of facilities for addicts, unfortunately. And I wish we do, because um, it's very much needed. Um, it's, ser it's serious, and there are so many different facets of addiction. There's so many different facets, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not, it's, it's just, it's not available, and I hope that it would be available for, you know, a service that could really help people and, um, and work it through. We need a, a very profound, uh, highly trained uh, team mm -hmm. where we do have some facilities, but they're not enough mm -hmm. to serve. So I recently, six months or so, had a conversation with someone who is part of the drug control, Department of Drug Control in Saudi Arabia, Mukafahad al Mukhaddarat. And, um, and I was asking him, I was like, well, what's the landscape like there today? Um, do you guys offer help? Or is it um, putting people in jail for carrying such? He was like 15, 10, 15 years ago, it was just that. You know, we, we drug busts, you know, we find out, you know, we, we find the criminals and, you know, we, we lock them up. But today it's more than that. That department obviously is there. But there's a whole new department where uh, there's a lot of concern for the wellness of people who are using it. So it's no longer about you go in jail it's about how can we help you get over this addiction that you do have and it was nice to see that coming from the top down mm. um it um you know it just it just gave me assurances that wow you know like it's people who suffer from that can uh find help today as opposed to just being locked up or being yeah. a criminal it was refreshing yeah uh, it 
I mean, addiction is an illness, and it gets worse. It does not get better. And you have to look at it as an illness, like any other illness, yeah. and treat it as so. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's like a condition. Um, I imagine a lot of people that come to you um, are, for whatever reason, unhappy. They want to fix something. Um, what's a common theme that you see in people who appear to be unhappy? What is it that they're doing wrong, if anything? Well, the common, some of the common themes are understanding boundaries and working through them. Self-esteem is another one. You know, really not looking um, at your sense of worth. Um, also, the you know, I'm getting a lot of people with the with the imposter syndrome. You know, I'm not really as good as I am. Uh, I'm fooling everybody. You know, and th they're brilliant people. They're, it's like they're a amazing. Victim, victim mentality almost. Um, and uh, depression, anxiety is another big one. Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Uh, how do you work through that? And what are the causes? Um, Again, you know, if it's left alone, it'll turn into a depression. Not a lot of OCDs. I don't somehow or another they don't come to me. <laughs> OCDs. Just, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, the way it's referred to in culture today, it's done in a jokey way. Oh God, you're so OCD mo. You know, if I put the remotes like this, and I do that. You know, I facing the TV, they've got to be like just perfect. That's the extent of, of my OCD. And it's and it's like, it's funny, you can laugh at it. But OCD is, is a hell of a condition. I mean, how bad is OCD? Can you draw a picture of it? It's only as bad as if it gets in the way of your life. But if you like cleanliness and you like uh, orderness, and it's not in the way of your life, you're okay, you know? But if it interferes in your job, particularly your job, in your family, then that is an issue. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to tackle that. So it's, it's, it's all about how much it actually interferes in the individual's life, you know? So what kind of complications can a severe case of OCD look like? being stuck on this one task and unable to move on to the next because this one is not 100%. It could turn into, for, the, uh, for example, if you're afraid of, if you hear someone is ill and then you say, no, that would be an anxiety. Um, an OCD would be um, cleanliness. Mm. You've got to wash your hand many, many times till your hand is actually um, bruise, um, uh, cut down, you know, from soap. Oh, wow. uh, there's a, and then it turns into a ritual. Before you wash your hands, you you top at, at the doorknob, and then you do all sorts of rituals, like maybe five, six rituals, and the rituals increases as the years in, go by. That by the time you finish the rituals, by the time you finish all that then the OCD hits again and you do it again. A big one would be with the OCD is uh, did I turn the stove on or turn it off, you know? And you would be out of the house and come back again wow. and uh, make sure that the stove is off. Well, that is interfering in your life, you know? You can't, you, you'll be late to work or you'll be late to whatever you're going, you know? And if you're washing your hands many times a day, your hands are going to suffer. Physically, you're going to be suffered. So um, that's, these are serious issues that needs to be tackled. Is it common? Is it, is it um, a, an illness or a condition rather that is rising in prominence? Not based on my experience, no. Okay. I think anxiety is probably mo mo much more and depression is much more. From all the uh, you know, life coaches that I follow online or books that I read, a common theme of advice is to stop watching the news. And unfortunately, we live in a time where uh, negativity sells like it's like yeah. fear mongering almost. We saw it with Corona and so forth. Um, 
Is news something that, you know, we should lay off a little if we're feeling anxious? Absolutely, yes. If it's a source, a source of your anxiety, absolutely, you know. And if you're sort of, um, the best way is you've got to hear the news to know what's going on in the world. But then um, make it into a 15 minutes instead of a whole entire day or half a day or so. Cut, that, cut it down or once a week. Mm-hmm. You know, or if it's important enough, it'll find you. Oh, it's important enough, it'll find you. Yes, <laughs> if worthy news will find you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but really, the way they, uh, it's just all negative, negative, negativity sells. It's just unbelievable. Um, would you say we're generally a happy country, or do we hide it well? I, I, I would. <laughs> Well, I, I know that the, this research that came out and said Saudi Arabia is a happy country. And when I looked at the research, it actually focused on, um, you know, it's a society that's quite spiritual and financially, economically stable, you know. And I think if these are the measures, then yes, we are uh, very, very happy. And, you know, the culture has changed enormously. So that probably contributed to a lot of personal freedom and and doing a lot of like really nice things. Uh, so I don't know, happiness is, is a state of being, as happiness is experience that you create to make sure that you stay happy. I feel like every day for you in, in your practice when you see someone, it's, it's, it's an accomplishment, it's success. What would you say is your greatest accomplishment? I think that giving back to society is probably my greatest accomplishment is helping the individual uh, move forward in their lives and i've also noticed that it isn't about the individual uh, it's also about their family and their friends so it's it it's the rippling effect it's so exciting because once one individual actually is helped so with the whole family, because the dynamic of the family has to change. So that's exciting. Um, it's a very gratifying um, job I do, and I'm very, I have passion, and I love what I do, and it's very truly emotionally gratifying than anything I have done in my life. Is every case treatable? Has there been a case where a patient was unable to make any progress or is every patient that comes through the door um, able to improve? Well, if you're talking about severe mental illness and that would be uh, a severe dysfunctional individual with uh, bipolar or schizophrenic, um, that's out of my scope. Okay. Okay. But if you're a high functioning bipolar or even very high functioning schizophrenic, then what you will gain from therapy is the skills. But you have to take medication. Medication is a total must because it stabilizes the mood. But you get the skills when you're on a high or when you're on a low. What do you do? What decisions do you make? You know, um, because that's the greatest benefit you get and th- and that's usually the hardest g- group of people to work with is because they really want to um, integrate with society they really want to work things through but then this mental health issues really interfering in their lives um, anything else like even severe depression yes of course it's treatable even if you can't get out of the bed yes it's treatable it's not the end of the world, you know. Um, you have to just find someone who's highly trained. Uh, a coach won't do it. It has to be someone who's highly trained in the field. Um, if you have um, sexual abuse issues, if you have um, family dynamic, you know, issues, yes, of course it is. Being bullied. Yes. Yes. Stays with you. Though. Stays with, of course, is, is very traumatic being bullied. It sometimes shapes you and how you are with others mm-hmm. and your self-esteem. So um, so that, of course, it could be tanko- tackled. 
you touched on two um, conditions that uh, I, I feel are the most severe being bipolar and schizophrenia. Are those two conditions something that you are born with or can you get it um, you know, throughout life? Some research says that it skips a generation, but not necessarily. Uh, yes, you are born with, you know, and it becomes a trigger. And these two particular illnesses, they actually hit you when you are in your adolescence, when it becomes more obvious. So we see our youngsters going to the States or to the West, uh, being educated, and then they're hit with an episode uh, of uh, schizophrenic or bipolar. Uh, and then the parents think, well, you know, the state did it. There's something that happened there. Actually, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't cope, you know, and it just hit really hard. Um, Are there a lot of examples of that? A lot of examples, they would, you know, and you would hear stories that he was okay till he went to university abroad, you know, and it wasn't the university. And even in universities all over the world, or in the States in particular, um, they actually have a therapist on premises, mainly because of the severe mental illness. They tend to come out at that age group between, mostly anyway, between age 15 to age um, 20, 24. Um, not every case actually comes in this, but this is the majority age group that sort of uh, becomes very present. Mm -hmm. And it's very disabling and, if, and needs to be treated, and you have to have medication. Um, and usually people who are affected by the illness hate medication because it keeps them lethargic, very slow, very difficult to get out of bed, and they don't like and they would skip medication. And then the family really struggles with that too. I think it's down to every family to know whether their child would do well in an environment away from home. You know, university in the U.S. isn't for everyone. University out of the country, you know, where they're from, you know, their, their comfort zone isn't for everyone. I think parents should play a big role in monitoring, assessing whether their child would thrive or struggle. And I think if you know your child well enough, you should be able to determine whether they'll be okay or not abroad. Some, some, you know, some kids probably have a weak personality and could be easily manipulated by other people over there and, and start doing things that can be detrimental to themselves. Right. I mean, if a parent is going to decide to send their child abroad, then prepare them. Just prepare them prepare how they could handle things, prepare their independence, their decision-making, their choices. You can't send a teen, you know, at age 17, 18, unprepared. No. It's a lifetime prepared. True. You know, so if the child is not, or, or the teen is not ready because they haven't been prepared, then yes, maybe a good, That's yeah. But it's, it isn't like every child can be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. A personal question here, Madiha. Who do you invite to dinner if you can choose anyone out there? I'll invite you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go out with you. <laughs> oh, I'm so touched. You're amazing. <laughs> yeah, you've met so many people and you, <laughs> you know, I want to know all about them. I wasn't them. <laughs> expecting that at all. Man, I'm blushing now. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, is there someone uh, out there that you haven't met that you you know would really like to pick their brain for you know a best part of two hours? Yes, uh, I mean uh, Mandela. I would love to sit with him, and uh, Gandhi. I would love to sit with him. Um, Samira Islam. I mean, Samira Islam is is um, the first educated woman who had a PhD, and uh, and my aunt. That's your aunt, yes. <laughs> I, I find her really interesting and, and how she actually left Saudi Arabia and went out for an education. I would love to go out with her to dinner. Um, there's a lot of great women. So I'm always asked, what's my relation to her when people hear that my last name is Islam? What's your relation to Samira? 
and I'm like, she's my aunt, and people are like, wow, she is just an incredible lady. The amount of people that said that to me, I feel like that 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 uh, a Netflix original slash documentary should be made <laughs> about uh, about her life because you know, yeah, she was, um, you know, one of the first females to to you yeah. know be educated abroad and. Um, and 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 today she is in education still. You know she is a a doctor at uh, King Abdul Aziz University here in Jeddah. She's still, yeah. you know, university every day teaching. Um, addicted to education, bless her. Yes, she she is a, an incredible woman. And uh, th there's a lot of people I would like to go out mm. for dinner with. You know, it's a tough uh, question. Yeah, it, it, but, but there's so many. Yeah. And uh, mostly I'd love to go out with a lot of women who have really accomplished. And there are many, yep. many, you know, very difficult to sort of recall anybody on off of my head. Mm -hmm. Since, you know, you mentioned that you're so happy doing this, how much longer do you see yourself doing it for? Is, is retirement, you know, and um, moving to an island abroad <laughs> uh, ever in your plans? Or I, I, do you just love doing what you're doing, you know, day in, day out? I really love doing what I'm doing day in and day out. And I could still go to this uh, island <laughs> and do it digitally because my practice have actually changed digital. And uh, I still could, you know, continue. Yeah. I don't think I'll see myself uh, stop. I really find a lot of um, joy in giving back. I love hearing stories of people who are so passionate in what they do. You know, they are truly the happiest people. And I think everyone has something that they are amazing at inside. And if you haven't found it, it's not because you're not amazing. It's because you haven't found it yet. Yes. I feel like God is fair in giving every single one of us a, a talent, you know, and a, something that they are very good at. Absolutely right. And it doesn't drop like, on your lap. You've got to go out there and explore it. It sounds cliche, but genuinely, like I, I swear, I really believe that everyone has something amazing in them. And you got to find out what it is that 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 is your amazing yes. for you to share with the world. Uh, is there any uh, stories that you want to leave us with? Any advice to uh, youngsters, um, elders, anything? Um, you know, we just want to pick your brain for one or two last pieces of wisdom. Get to know yourself better. Understand your emotion. Understand the core of you, and be comfortable with you. You know, I think getting to know yourself and open all the fears that you have, go into them, find out where they come from. Don't be afraid of you. You are amazing. Mm. Yeah. It's the theme of this episode. Yeah. You know, I um, I always thought deep down that, and it's just, it's being confirmed to me more and more that we all need therapy. You know, the world is a lot more complicated than it was ever. You know, every day is more complicated. Like tomorrow is gonna be more complicated than today. There's just more people, there's more problems, there's more issues. We all need therapy in some capacity. Um, and I've seeked therapy and I felt my life change for the better. Oh, great. I did, absolutely. Yeah. Just going back to what you said earlier, just having that conversation, getting it off your chest. Yeah. If not with your spouse, with a family member, with a friend, Everyone has at least, I would like to think, that one person who, you know, hopefully you won't feel that a story that you would share with that person would be judged. You know, they would yeah. take it in, in a good way. So just the element of speaking and letting things out can change your perspective and improve the, the quality of your life, I feel. It did mine. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm, I'm really a, I'm a believer yeah. in, in, in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Madiha, for sharing uh, everything that it is you do. It's something that I love seeing how passionate you are. You've been practicing it for 25 years. You went to Columbia University, for goodness sake, mashallah. Only one of the best schools in the world. Um, and you help people. What is better than that? I I'm very gratified. I'm very fortunate that I have this job that I, I'm put in a place where I help people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I love it. And... You know, on um, now that I have your number, and if I'm ever having a, a dark day or, or need some help, um, <laughs> you are the person I'm going to come to. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. My best to your daughter, Sara. She's an old friend. Um, and uh, again, honestly, thank you so much for taking the time. 
and coming on the Mo Show and um, being episode 37. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you again.